morning, everyone. Again, as usual, um, feel free to chat amongst yourselves today. And we will um, answer questions as go forward. If you have a question, either raise your hand or put title it question in the chat um, and we can go from there. Um, we're gonna do the same thing for the first 45 minutes. Today, we are going to go over the uh, orbital mechanics lecture um, and we'll go through some questions. We can answer questions and the like. The second 45 minutes, we're going to go through some problems and questions and the like in preparation and talk about how you can prepare for the midterm quiz um, and some, some adjustments and stuff to take in mind with the midterm quiz. Um, okay, so if you have any questions that you want to talk about for the midterm quiz, please uh, put it in the question thing uh, towards the end of this lecture. Um, as I said, we'll go for about 45 minutes here, and then we're going to take a 15-minute break, um, give everybody a chance to a 10 to 15-minute break, uh, give everybody a chance to stretch and use facilities, get a glass of water or whatever else you want, coffee. Um, and then we'll come back at the top of the hour at 11, and we'll go through questions and the like um, and, and such. Okay. So as we get started here... Um, So we get started here. I'm going to start a poll like I do every week. Um, and this one's on orbital mechanics. And then we're going to go through the poll. So um, answer the poll as you can. And if you have any questions, either raise your hand or ask a question while we're going through the poll. We can talk about those questions. Or if it's part of the poll, I'll, I'll just say we'll, we'll get to it. Um, as always, this is being recorded. Can you all see the poll? Yes. Okay. Just no one's voted as, as of yet.
We are uh, answering the poll. Yeah, anastasis. Give you a couple more minutes to finish the poll. Yeah, again, with all of these polls, don't worry um, if you don't know the answer. Just try to uh, guess based on the best you can. Um, and the reason I want you to guess or try something is it gives you an anchor point when we discuss a little bit more. Uh, when are you getting the glider quiz marks? Uh, so I should be releasing them later today, I think. Yeah, we're now far enough out that um, I can release them. I just have to make them active again. So the midterm quiz is 10% of the unit mark. The glider quiz and the systems activity quiz are worth 20% each. And the final exam, which will be an hour and a half long online exam, open notes, open book, open internet, not open colleague in January um, will be 50% of the mark. And we can talk a little bit more about the final exam and the second hour if you want and how they relate to the other exams and all of that. Um, but um, we'll definitely talk more about it uh, as we get further along. Uh, you should get your date and time in December. So we're looking at the last week of teaching in December. You'll get a timetable and uh, the time that your exam will start and it's synchronously started. Okay. Okay, so let's just, um, I'm going to close the poll here. Anybody else want to answer the poll before I close it? We have 83 of 123, 122 people have voted. Um, so it's reasonable enough. Um, and we'll go through that. Um, we're going to go through the midterm quiz timing in the second hour of today. Um, again, it opens this Friday at 6 p.m. Okay. First question from the uh, activity is, do spacecraft experience drag? Or this is true, false, spacecraft experience drag. 73% of you said true, 27% of you said false. Now, we're gonna talk about this in two different ways. We're gonna talk about the scientific way, and then we'll talk about the engineering way. In the scientific way, all vehicles anywhere in the universe will experience some amount of drag. And that's because there's no such thing as a perfect vacuum. You will impact other particles as you travel at some point. That's just scientifically true. So strictly correct, the answer is true. But we're not scientists. We're engineers. And from an engineering sense, it is the question is, does it matter to what we're trying to calculate, whether spacecraft experience drag or not? And the answer is, it depends. If you're doing low Earth orbit or low solar orbit or any other low Jovian orbit, any other body with a meaningful atmosphere, what we mean by meaningful is it's enough that you can get continuum mechanics, 
That means um, you're, you're not gonna know this yet, but there's a term called the Knudsen number is above a certain value, but Earth is definitely the case. Mars has a meaningful atmosphere. Venus sure does. The sun, all of those things. Moon does not have, a, the Earth's moon does not have a meaningful atmosphere. Oh, sorry. Yep, sorry about that. Um, does not have a meaningful atmosphere. Um, Earth's moon doesn't. Anything that has a meaningful atmosphere, if you're close enough to the body, you will experience meaningful drag. So International Space Station, for instance, is 500 kilometers above the Earth, roughly, and it loses about a nautical mile of altitude every month. So 1.8 kilometers every month, just due to atmospheric drag. So we send spacecraft up there. Back in the days when space shuttle was operating, we would send space shuttle up and they would use the orbital maneuvering system on space shuttle to boost the altitude by several, kilom several miles, several kilometers. Um, if you're doing very low Earth orbit uh, satellites, like uh, the Discoverer program is researching here at the university, then drag is even more substantial. And actually, we also can get lift, so you can do both. So remember from the flight mechanics lecture last week, we talked about the case where you don't have to, you can ignore the centrifugal acceleration, the, the V squared over R term. Well and just can't focus on the aerodynamic lift. Well, in satellites, it's V squared over R is all we care about. Except for very low orbit, we no longer ignore the L and the D terms. We actually use those to our advantage. So L over D, this metric we use for aerodynamics, which we'll talk about in topic seven in two weeks, is, is, is important for those satellites. Now, what happens if you're a geostationary orbit, geosynchronous orbit, or you're traveling to Mars, or you're traveling to Jupiter, or you're Voyager, um, and outside the solar system and the sun's sphere of influence, um, then it really depends on how fast you're going and how, therefore, how many particles you interact. Because what we know, basic rule of thumb, is the faster you go, the more particles you'll interact, inter encounter in any given period of time. So if we're traveling the speed of 20,000 kilometers a second, which isn't a lot, or even less, something like that, very small fraction of the speed of light, we don't really care about drag and drag doesn't exist for those spacecraft. If we were traveling 95, 98% of the speed of light, oh yeah, we'd be experiencing drag again. So answer to question one, it depends scientifically, all spacecraft experience drag, but from an engineering point of view, it depends on this case and the state you're in, okay? Any questions on that before we move on to the next bit? Okay, next question. The periarian represents what? And um, it's interesting because someone actually asked what Aryan means in the chat and someone answered quite nicely so that um, some of you will get it right. Um, yeah, so strictly speaking, it's true, but it isn't true in the sense that we really care about it. So, um, so if it's scientifically true, Amber, uh, it, it, that's absolutely. So I said, from a scientific point of view, everyone, but from an engineering point of view, it depends. So more likely what I'll ask is a question like, does a spacecraft traveling between Earth and Mars experience meaningful drag, a, you know, like a probe? And the answer to that would be no. Or I might say, does a, uh, does a spacecraft in very low Mar Mars orbit or Aryan orbit experience drag? And the answer is yes. And we use that, it's called aerobraking. So that's the type of question you might see. Okay, para-Aryan, I just kind of gave it away. It represents what? And you're right, it's the orbit around Mars. So we say uh, geo, perigee, apogee for Earth, helion uh, from Helios for the Sun, Arian is for Mars, Jovian for Jupiter. So we know it's gonna be not a generic orbit, but many of you copped on to the other part of the word. Um, and we know it's not going to be the, f um, it's going to be Mars. It's not going to be Venus, Neptune, or the like. Now, peri versus apo, periapsis, apoapsis. And as we remember from the lecture notes, periapsis is the point of the orbit that's closest to the body you're orbiting. So peri periarian will be the closest point on an orbit around Mars, and apoarian is the furthest point on an orbit around Mars. And I don't know if there's a mnemonic to help you with these things. Um, you know, obviously it's a bit of a trick question. I wouldn't expect you to remember the term Arian 
in a, in a quiz or an exam. Um, I might say para-Aryan around Mars or something like that to clue you in. I don't expect you to remember those things. I expect you to remember periapsis, apoapsis, perigee, apogee. The rest of it is a little bit more sophisticated. So we're going to use generic terms for most of the bodies we're orbiting. Okay, but it was just to see if you remembered, include that in and thought about it. Um, in fact, I think the bigger one is, do you remember if it's nearest or furthest? Okay. <laughs> well, Constantinos, you do have an advantage over some of the other ones. Okay. Um, and number three, I misspelled, and this is a classic one. It's closed, not close. Um, and most of you seem to have gotten that. Um, closed orbits have what type of specific energy? And 73% of you said negative, 17% of you said strictly zero, and 11% said positive. And again, it is negative. Um, and that's a real challenge. So what we have a closed orbit, that's a, that's a good one. Um, and they're gonna be negative. Um, for an orbit with an eccentricity of one, which of the following is true? It's a conic section it's an ellipse, it's a parabola, it's a hyper, hyperbola, the specific energy is greater than zero, the specific energy is equal to zero, or the specific energy is less than zero. Okay, um, I did see, Shalom, I did see your question, I'll get to it in just a second. Okay, for those of you, the 19% of you that put conic section, does anybody wanna explain why they put conic section? Yeah, so Lewis, you're absolutely right. Every orbit is a conic section. Does everybody remember what the, the canonical conic sections are? So we have parabola, yeah, that's one of them. Hyperbola, ellipse, and one other one. Circle, yep, so those are conic sections and it's just the inclination of the orbit or of the bit through our cone. So if it's horizontal in our cone, it's a circle. And as it goes up an angle, it goes through ellipse, parabola, hyperbola. And it just depends if it's open or closed on that surface. Okay, um, those of you who said it's an ellipse, anybody wanna explain that's 21% of you. So all orbits are conic sections. Um, some of you said it was an ellipse. 21% of you said an ellipse. Why did you say the orbit was an ellipse? That's what I was taught at A-level. What were you taught at A-level? Uh, I was taught that all, all orbits were ellipses. Ah, okay. So all closed orbits are ellipses. You can have an open orbit because you start around the body. It's just that you'll then be escaping. So, yeah, we think of orbits, people say orbits, they're automatically closed, but our orbits can be open. They can be escape. Um, and they're, they're not ellipses, they're still conic sections. Okay, 56% of you said parabola, um, which is the correct answer. It is a parabola. That is by the definition of something that's an eccentricity of one. So if the X, eccentricity is less than one, but greater than zero, it's a, an ellipse. If it's zero exactly, it's that special ellipse called a circle, yep. Yeah. Um, and if it's greater than one, it's a hyperbola. Okay, so that's obviously answers uh, six. Okay, the next three are on the specific energies of the orbit. 18% um, of you said it's greater than zero, 39% said it's strictly zero, and 15% said less than zero. This is a really important one. And these type of things can come up on things like midterm quizzes. Why, how do we relate specific energy to eccentricity? Does anybody know what's a quick way of relating the two?
If our eccentricity is one, our specific energy is zero. So what that means is that when we reach zero, our orbit opens. So if it has a positive specific energy, our orbit is open and faster than a parabola. So it's an eccentricity of greater than one. And when it's not zero, less than zero, it's closed. And we can go back to our simple, um, <coughs> our <coughs> simple equation for specific energy. Um, Let me bring it up for you. So what's the difference between specific energy and potential energy? So specific energy is the, the total amount of energy relative to the escape energy required. Right? So if they're the same, it's zero. And if they're... Um, if they're, if it's less than the escape energy, it's closed. If it's greater than the escape energy, because it's relative to that that escape velocity function. So that mu over two a, where a is your your apo, um, your major ax, semi major axis, and so therefore that's the velocity. If at that point you have enough energy that your 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 orbit becomes open, you've reached your escape velocity effectively, the energy for your escape velocity. Okay. And that's all the relationship is. Just think of it as a relationship between the energy needed to escape from the body and the energy uh, of your orbit, just the, the delta in that. So mu over 2a, everybody remember what mu is? Everybody remember what mu is in this case? Yeah, it's our gravitational parameter. It is equivalent to the depth of the gravity well that we're in. So the gravity, gravitational parameter, gravity well, that's G times M, big G times big M. So it's the big body. So this works really well when we're a small mass orbiting a much, much larger mass. So a spacecraft orbiting Earth or Earth orbiting the sun. It doesn't work so well when the two masses are very similar. So Pluto and Chiron co-orbiting each other, they're a bit different. So as we said, we our specific energy, when we reach the escape energy required, we're good to go, okay? Um, and then, of course, 23% of you rightly said it's an escape orbit. So it, it's all of these things. It has a specific energy of zero, it's a parabola, it's a conic section, and it's an escape orbit. It's what we call our lowest energy escape orbit, or the lowest required energy or delta V escape orbit. If we want to get somewhere faster, what type of escape orbit, what type of conic section do we aim for? Yeah, A is, uh, yeah, hy hyperbolic. A is semi-major axis of your ellipse. B is the semi-minor. Semi-major is the longer axis of the two. Okay, so to minimize the energy required to change inclination, which of the following should you do? Burn at periapsis, burn at apoapsis, burn retrograde, burn prograde, and combine your burrs, burns, where appropriate. Uh, key on those things sometimes is those where appropriate stuff. So 27% of you said burn at periapsis. Anybody want to volunteer why they said burn at periapsis? Let me reshare it for you guys, just in case. I think it disappeared because I had shared my screen. Anybody want to volunteer why they said periapsis? Remember, delta V required is two, two times 
the velocity you're traveling at times one half, the sine of one half of your inclination change. So what do we want to do? If we want the minimum delta V, we want to burn at the point where we have minimum velo actual instantaneous velocity. And minimum delta V translates to minimum energy required because obviously a delta V for our given satellites is, is equates to a change in, in kinetic energy. If we change that we double the velocity, we've quadrupled the kinetic energy change. Obviously our propulsion systems are not 100% efficient. We're gonna talk more about those measures in several weeks, but for now we just know they're not 100% efficient. So if you wanna put the minimum energy in, you wanna do it at the minimum velocity. Where do we have the minimum velocity? Is it at periapsis or apoapsis? Apoapsis. So we typically want to burn at the apoapsis. Okay, the next two, 14% um, of you said burn retrograde and 23% of you said burn prograde. Anybody want to say why they said retrograde? And don't worry, I mean, the purpose of this. Yeah, don't worry about spelling apoapsis. I'm not going to try to make you fill in the blank with the word apoapsis. Um, I learned the hard way. Fill in the blanks can be very dangerous, especially since center and gravity seem to have about 45 different spellings according to students each. So I'm not gonna get you to spell apoapsis in any way that would be auto graded. Uh, that's just insanity on my part. So who, anybody want to volunteer why they put burn retrograde? Or prograde, either one. Okay. So does everybody remember what retrograde and prograde mean in terms of burns? Yes, Thomas, it absolutely does depend on which way you want to incline. If you want to increase your inclination, your delta V has to be positive. Does, if it's a positive delta V, which direction is the burn, retrograde or prograde? It's prograde. If you want to decrease your inclination, you're going to burn retrograde. So both of those can be appropriate depending on the type of inclination change you want, but they're not always appropriate. So we wouldn't check everywhere else. Okay, the last one, combine burns where appropriate. So when you see a question like this and a statement like this, where appropriate, the changes, instead of having to be appropriate for every condition, it's now appropriate. It might, you only have to find out if it's appropriate for any one condition. So. Why would we want to combine our burns? Say we wanted to, why would we want to say, combine a raising of our periapsis with our inclination change? Why do we want to do that? And why do we save energy? And, yeah. Yes, so we use the same amount of fuel to view, do two things. We're changing our, 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 our peri, periapsis altitude at the same time we're changing our inclination. But what is it about what we're doing? What is it that allows us to save energy and save fuel? Okay, Shalom, I'll, I'll explain inclination here in just a second. Okay. The reason we can do that is it's just a vector sum. So remember x squared plus square root of x squared plus y squared, if we're in 2D Cartesian, 
is the vector rate, the vector line. And basically for the same magnitude of your vector, if you combine two things, you get benefits across both. The sines and the cosines work to your advantage. So if I'm changing my inclination, changing direction and speed effectively at the same time, I can do that much more cheaply than do one and then the other. And that's just what we do. Okay. so. There was a question real quickly of what is inclination? What do I mean by inclination? Let's go back to our, our notes and our orbital elements. And I'm gonna hide the pole for just a second, um, just so you all can see this. So we have our orbital Keplerian elements. Imagine this sphere is our earth um, or the body we're going around. We have our equatorial plane, which is simply on earth, the equator. We have our orbital, orbital plane, this blue line here, which is... Um, uh, how, how yes, you know Dan? How could you know the difference between the equatorial plane and the orbital plane? Because there isn't so, an XY axis in, in real life. So I don't yeah. understand how you could know where the position would be. Okay, so what we do is we define our orbit around a body by these elements. So we choose the equatorial plane effectively. And the equatorial plane is the point on the body because the body is rotating where the rotational velo the, the velocity V of the surface is highest. So the poles are the point with zero rotational velocity, you know, actual velocity from rotation and the equator is the point of the highest. We're just defining that. It's the equator on earth. There's a Martian equator. There's a Venusian equator. There's a sun equator that we don't use the equator of the sun for some reason, um, we use Earth's orbit. So we're just saying we define it as the equatorial plane. And what that means is, you know, any orbit that's doing that, you get the most benefit of the velocity when launching. And then inclination is literally just the angle, this I, between your orbital plane and your equatorial plane. So if your inclination is zero, you're orbiting at the equator. If your inclination is 90 degrees, you're orbiting over the poles. And that's all it is. It is, we are literally defining it as such. Now, for a sun-centered orbit, we tend to use not the equatorial plane, unfortunately. We use the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is literally the path that, or, the, that the plane, that the Earth's orbit draws around the sun. So something in the ecliptic can cause an eclipse. That's all it is. But we are defining these reference frames for our convenience, for our use. There is nothing about the reference frames that is, um, that's fixed or hard or any of that. There's any, all of that stuff, okay? And we'll go back to that in just a second because I had to bring up the, uh, your, your chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing the poll again drag it down to the side and we'll go back to that screen share because several of you have, what are these symbols? Gamma and all of this stuff. So let's go back to that because you need to remember these. Okay. Uh, are you, when you say gamma, let me bring up chat um, here. When you say gamma, do you mean this one here? Yeah, that's actually a psi. Um, it's it's one of the orbital, uh, it's just a, a reference definition thing. Don't worry about that one per se. So again, we have our equatorial plane, the ascending node here, this dot is our ascending node. Our ascending node is the point where the orbit crosses the equator going northwards. Gotta love that going in a positive direction versus a negative direction. So we then have what's called the RA, sorry, the right argument of the ascending node, which is this capital omega. And it's, if we look down on the plane, it's how far right of the vernal equinox. <laughs> you gotta love these things. All I ask you to remember is be able to look that up. And it just tells you where, as we go around the equator, your orbit crosses the equator going upwards. Obviously it crosses going downwards again, 180 degrees out of phase. 
Then we have our argument of periapsis, which is how far above the equator, right here, this purple, the actual spacecraft is at a given, oh, sorry, the plane is. And then we have our true anomaly, which is where our spacecraft is. It's all a bit weird. It all has to do with transformations. So our omega, our argument of periapsis, and our inclination, plus our right ascending node, give what our orbit looks like around the body. And then A, E, and uh, V give where the spacecraft is. OK? So do we need to understand what ascending node um, and all these bits and bobs are for the exam? Yeah. So what I would say is you need to understand it well enough to be able to choose from multiple choice questions. So the ascending node, just it's where the or it's where the orbit crosses the equator going up or north, positive Z in this case. And the descending node will be where it crosses going negative Z. That's all you have to say. Um, and then argument of periapsis and inclination are these weird um, combinations of stuff. It's where your periapsis is. And so what that allows us to do is we know the orbital inclination. We know where in that going up from the ascending node your argument of periapsis is. And it just can, you can use that with semi-major axis and eccentricity and true anomaly to find exactly where in space around the center of the Earth or the center of the um, sun, solar, whatever it is that your, your, um, your spacecraft is. Don't expect any question right now that asks you to calculate the position of the spacecraft in an orbit. It's just knowing the basic definitions here for familiarity. Next semester, next year in space systems, you're going to get a lot deeper into this and there you're going to need to know it. So un just having some familiarity with the terms gives you a starting point. Uh, Vernal equinox. <laughs> so so yeah. on, um, in one of the slides you had I as 98 degrees. 98 degrees? How can I go above 90 degrees? How can it go above 90? Okay, so, so 90, because remember we're going up like this, I can have an orbit that runs this direction, that runs back the, against the direction of a rotation, what we call a retrograde orbit. If I have an orbit like that, remember I measure I goes from zero to 180. It, it's half a circle because negative is just the opposite side. So once you go above 90 degrees, you're retrograde. So my I can switch all the way around from zero to 180. You can have, theoretically have, a satellite orbiting at the equator, about the equator, going the wrong way around. Okay. I see a lot of you are talking about the Kerbal Space Program. Uh, it's a fun, fun one. Um, and you're welcome to play it. Okay. Uh, it really should be a module just to play KSP. No, that's not a bad idea. Okay, let's talk about the vernal equinox here for a second. So the vernal equinox is this bit here, this psi. And what the vernal equinox is, it's the point in Earth's orbit around the sun where for that brief period of time, the equatorial plane matches the ecliptic. And then Earth is rising above the ecliptic. So it's the point where we are on Earth is at the ascending node in the heliocentric space. We can then point to that from the center of Earth, point out to that vernal equinox point at all points in our orbit. So just imagine we're going around the sun and we know where on our orbits the vernal equinox. This x-axis is always pointing at that point in space. Fun, fun, fun. Okay? And that's all the vernal equinox is. For, for those of us in northern hemisphere, it's the start of spring. 
Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the start of autumn. Um, it is the day, theoretically, when the day, the day and the night sun is above the horizon for as long as it's below the horizon, and the days are going to get are getting longer. But if we draw, and and what I'll do here uh, is I'll draw. It's really hard to draw on a piece of paper, but if you draw the orbit of the Earth around the sun, that point, which is roughly around the 21st of March, yes, the spring equinox, exactly. Um, but we use, because we, we, we don't like it to be straightforward. We use the word vernal and autumnal. And, um, um, it's that point. And your X just always points to that. That's all it does, it always points. So basically remember as your earth moves around the sun, that X is in the solar heliocentric view is shifting. So let me see if I can draw this. And we will share. This is the fun bit. Let's see if this works because I'm doing it on the fly instead of having it set up ahead of time. So this is our sun. And that's our Earth's orbit around the sun. Imagine there is Earth right now. And imagine this point here, that's our vernal equinox. Then X points that way. Y points that way. If Earth is here, X points that way. And Y points that way. That's all it is. OK? And that's how we just do our translation. Why, why is this created, this vernal equinox? Why do we create it? Because um, it, is, it is a creation of us. We're the ones who created it. And we created it specifically to give us a constant reference point for our calculations. Otherwise, every time we come and we talk about it with anybody else, we'd have to define every point of our, our reference frames. But by coming up with a convention, it means that we can more commu easily communicate. It's just like when we talk about aircraft, we use the wing plan form, wing plan form area as the reference area. And we do that all just by convention because it makes communication easier. Okay. Um, a couple more quick questions in the poll, which has now gone away. Um, so I don't have the results. Oh, here we go. Share the results. Um, what factors affect the delta V required to escape, achieve escape? 50%, 6 percent of you said the depth of the gravity well. Good on you. That is correct. 61% um, said the radius of the orbit. Absolutely. 51% um, said the mass of the spacecraft. Remember, delta V, not energy, is not determined by the mass of the spacecraft, nor time of burn, um, but direction of burn uh, can affect it. So it's really these first three, depth of gravity, well, radi uh, first two, and then the velocity, current velocity of the spacecraft. Because remember, you have an escape velocity and you have a current velocity, so the delta V is the difference between the two. And then what type of burn should you undertake uh, to raise your periapsis, what type of burn should you undertake? And it is, as 43% of you said, prograde at the apoapsis. Remember, if you want to raise or lower the periapsis, you do it at the apoapsis. And if you want to raise or lower the apoapsis, you do it at the periapsis. So you raise, you change the opposite point of your orbit when you make a burn. Um, you don't change the point you're at. And so we tend to do that. So if you want to get escape, you want to raise your apoapsis to infinity. And then that means the lowest point typically is the periapsis is the lowest delta V point. And it's a very odd one because remember VEE 
is a function of radius. So you have to do those maths. Okay. Please, sorry, yeah. but please could you explain um, what you mean by raise your periapsis? So raise the periapsis and raise the apoapsis. Okay, so we're gonna do that. We'll do that in the next hour and I will set that aside and we'll do that for you because um, we'll take our 10 minute break now. But this is a perfect, perfect question to have for, um, for something like a midterm type question or the like. So we'll talk about that. We'll draw a couple orbits, okay? Okay, guys, so I'm gonna pause the recording for now. Well, I'm gonna stop this recording. So we'll have two separate recordings. We'll start the recording. I will see you back here at the top of the hour. So we've got 12 minutes and we'll go through some things on the midterm. We'll talk a little bit more about the midterm. If you have any questions that you want related, um, uh, question six related to the escape. Question six is related to escape velocity equation, not the change in inclination equation. Yes, shade. Um, any questions that you want to answer before the midterm, um, don't do it yet, take a little break, but starting about five till, if you put the word question colon in the chat or raise your hand and we'll go there. Shalom, you have your hand raised before we break. I asked the question earlier, so I just forgot okay. to put it back down, sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'm just actually wanting to um, just go over what do you mean by prograde and retrograde again. I think I understand. I just wanted to. Okay, confirm. so so we'll do prograde and retrograde and and the new hour. So raise slash lower apsis and pro versus retro. Okay. Anything else anyone wants? Sorry, when are, well, are the marks for the glider activity released? Uh, today. I'll, I just have to turn them back on again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, I will see you in 10 minutes. Enjoy. I'm going to pause my video and mute my mic in the time. But at about 5 2, if you start putting question, in the uh, in the chat, we can. I'll write those questions out and we'll go through them. Okay.